Greetings and welcome to Decolonizing Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lindsay Gary. Powered by Gumbo the Podcast, Decolonizing Real Estate Podcast explores the colonial roots of real estate in the Western world. Roots that have historically led to the displacement of Black and Indigenous peoples and hindered their access to land. It does this while acknowledging that although there is an obvious need for land and property, it presents a cultural conundrum as the Western philosophies around land differ greatly from those in traditional African culture. Sitting alongside these ideas, this podcast ultimately speaks candidly about these topics while also working to increase real estate access for African people in this country and abroad from a decolonized and Afrocentric approach. On today's episode, we'll be discussing the ways we can combat racism in real estate. And our guest today will be sharing her knowledge of this topic and all of her amazing experience in the field of real estate. Today, we are joined by Ms. Cynthia Tibbs. And so Ms. Cynthia, thank you so much for being here. Please share with us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, I'm a native Texan and uh, I grew up in the Fifth Ward area. I uh, have a degree in um, business administration, uh, psychology, uh, human resource and organizational development. And I'm a real estate broker. I've been in this business over 40 years. I, I was trying to add up the years today. I think it's about 47, 48 years I've been in the business. Wow. I've taught wow. it for years as well. That's amazing. Yes, we're really joined by an expert. Okay, so I'm very, very excited to <laughs> talk to you today, to have you on today. And let's let's go ahead and jump into the conversation. So first of all, tell me about how you got into real estate. How were you introduced to it and what made you want to pursue a, a career in the field? Um, you know, children learn from those around them. And, and my grandparents who reared me uh, had rental properties on their lot. The big, our house was in the front. I think we had about four little rental houses behind us. And mm. sometimes my grandmother would tell me to take this receipt out to Miss So-and-so and get the money. And so it looked like me, three, four, five years old, looked like that's the way you got money. So I kind of picked it up from a family, uh, mm. especially my grandmother. And she always had rental properties for all of my life. So it's a oh, dual wow. income type thing for her. <laughs> And, and and outside of it, what made you, you know, seeing that growing up, right, seeing that as a young person, what made you actually want to pursue it as a profession, you know? Because, you know, you could grow up around it and not choose to take it up, you know, sure. as a career. Well, I saw the opportunity to earn additional money mm -hmm. with real estate. You know, um, most of the time when you're right out of college, you need a job so you can start paying bills and, and live. So I did get a regular corporate job um, because I needed that regular income. But after being there for a couple of years, I realized this is not going to be where I retired. Mm -hmm. I did not want to work in that type of environment forever. So I kind of just made that a goal to become an entrepreneur as my parent or uh, my father my grandparents, my great grandparents were all entrepreneurs. So they wanted mm. to know why I wasn't one. <laughs> so. <laughs> I love you. And what other kinds of entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurship were your other family members doing? Well, uh, to begin with, uh, we were always in the hospitality business. My great mm. grand had what we call back then a juke joint. She mm. made her own beer and other alcoholic beverages, you know, wow. from grapes and, you know, herbs and stuff that they had out in the country. But she made her own beer in the bathtub and sold it at the juke joint. Wow. And, uh, you know, they would have traveling minstrel people coming through these little small towns. And the Chitlin they would, Circuit. 
Well, it wasn't even chitlin then. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was a circuit came it's later. Before probably before. It's before the chitlin circuit. Before the so chitlin this, circuit. This yeah. is just the whole hog circuit. This the whole right, thing. Right, right. Because <laughs> the little the little singers and you know artists that were uh trying to make a living that way would have to go from town to town to the black communities or the right. Negro communities to get, you know the money they needed to live. So she loved those kind of shows. My grandmother um, told me and they, she loved them and she loved to dance to their music. So her friends uh, for some reason, Oh yeah. I remember she told me that um, the, her best friends thought she looked danced like one of the menstrual people who wore red shirt all the time. So that was her nickname, red shirt. But yeah, it was before the Chitlin circuit that they <laughs> own land. And they picked cotton to buy more land. Uh, each generation tried to add to the land, you know, that that the family owned and passed it down. That's that's what we were taught to think. If it, it, you know, you need to pass something down to your uh, heirs, your children, right? So mm. that they won't have to start at the same place you started. Mm. Oh, it's the legacy, you know, and yes. it's amazing. Um, every time I interview somebody for this particular podcast, they're saying the same thing and how important it is for us, especially as black people to maintain the land that our ancestors really worked hard for, because a lot of times that land wasn't given to them. <laughs> they had to work for it and they had to work hard to keep it and maintain it. Exactly. And, um, yeah. And so uh, we have to also continue that legacy and not just you know throw it away it's not you just the place to live you know right most, most of the um people i have dealt with in real estate are looking at houses rather than real estate right and unfortunately houses are not are part of the real estate but they're not the basis of real estate, the land is under all and uh, without land, you, you pretty much can't live on earth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cause even if you have a boathouse, eventually you need to come to shore and get supplies, gas up. So the land is the most important part because houses grow old, deteriorate. You have to keep That's fixing right. them up, but the land is indestructible. That's right. And also, even when it comes to the the water, there's water rights and it all is tied into real estate. Mineral too. rights, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's very true. I actually um, shared this on my last episode. My family uh, was recently contacted about some land that we didn't even realize we had. Um, and so it's just, yes. <laughs> it's a lot of that. Lie, but it's a lot of it. And uh, it's very important. We have an episode called Black Family Land Rights that we did a few months ago. And it's very important for Black people to be aware and to research that and to see, you know, if you or your parents, your grandparents have access. Because a lot of times we have it in our families and we might not know it, you know, if we moved exactly. away or, um, you know, if you lost touch with certain people, you know. And sometimes there's like a family member just paying taxes on that land and maintaining it. You may not even know that it's there. So it's important for us to do that and then to understand, like you said, it goes beyond the house itself, you know, that land is what's really important, especially um, for us when we weren't really brought here to have it, right? We were brought here to work it. Right. <laughs> but, you know, we have to take advantage of um, that because we need it actually for our own survival and maintaining our communities. And so, you know, with that, I want to, you know, transition into this uh, this uh, topic of combating real estate, uh, combating, uh, not real estate, right, but combating racism in real estate because I think part of the reason that we don't, a lot of black people don't know the things that you mentioned is because of racism, right? We have um, historically been left out of real estate conversations, right? Or we haven't been taught certain things and that's by design to keep us from realizing <laughs> the power in that. And so what are some things, you know, that come to mind um, when you talk about, when you think about the racism that we have in real estate, whether that's your own experience or just the system itself, because the system is one thing. And then there are also 
the individual experiences of, you know, you being a broker, right? Or, you know, just in general. Most of the, most of the people that I have worked with over the past almost 50 years were home buyers or first time business property buyers. Uh, and then they would, after the first ex experience, then they, they kind of get the hang of it and they want to do it again if they're investors. But if they're just mm. people who are looking for homes, the one thing that I would say that, and everybody knows this, our economic system is racist. Okay. Mm. And what, and, and, and I know when Trump was running the first time, uh, President Trump was running the first time, one of the guys that was leading a, an uh, all white organization said it, this country was built for us, meaning white people. Mm -hmm. And they're right. You know, yeah, it was. they fought mm -hmm. <clears throat> their own uh, colonists, <laughs> the, the British, so that they could have what they saw was possible through real estate in the United States. And keep in mind that the people that they sent over here were usually to colonize. They were either elitist like captains and generals and governors and po politicians that were uh, favored by the king, or mm -hmm. they were prisoners who <laughs> were given early release so that they could come to America and live and colonize and hold it down for England and France. Well, give, and them, give them the history. Give them the but, history. But that's the way it was. They, they released these poor criminal often. Some of them were murderers and some and of them prostitutes. Yeah, all kinds all of, of people were let go in America so that they could actually make it a colony. And that's how a lot of the people uh, in America, especially the English, became wealthy. Um, another way um, that they became wealthy, they were more educated than we were. You know, for 400 years almost, we, we weren't allowed to read. So, you know, since our freedom, it's only been about 100 and what, 50 years? And not long. We, we've, got a, we've got a lot to learn about our economic system that they don't teach in schools. They used to teach some things in school when I was young, but the more I hear about school these days and the more I see about the graduates of high school, I know they're not teaching that anymore. Not at all. Um, and so, you know, everybody needs a place to live, right? So why don't they teach you in school how to negotiate for property? Everybody in Houston, at least, needs a car almost. <laughs> So Absolutely. why don't they teach us how to negotiate to buy cars? How can we find out what's the best price? What's the best car? You know, why why isn't this taught? This should be exactly. part of our educational curriculum because you need that more than you need college right away. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? College is a four-year ordeal, but you got to live somewhere <laughs> while you're going to college. So right. And then the process of buying real estate is unique in every state. Mm -hmm. Every state has a unique process, but it, they all have something in common because that's the national part of it. But um, yeah, we have to do a better job of teaching our own because we can't expect someone who's Correct. trying to take advantage of us to be... Uh, informing us about what and, our rights are. And I and I want to touch on because you hit them with the history and I'm so glad you um brought it back to that. But I, before I get to that, even that this should not be knowledge that only people in the industry have. This is not knowledge just for somebody who's an agent or a broker. This is like life skills. Like yes. It's we very like life skill cuz you have yes. to live somewhere. Everybody has to live. And I remember even, um, you know, talking to people about this, like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. I'm like, 
what do you mean you don't want to deal with it? It's everywhere and it's intertwined with the whole system of the country. And I want to bring it with that point. I want to bring it back to what you said about how this country was colonized. You know, they, the Europeans that, you know, colonized, you know, the French, the Spanish, and then later the English and other groups, right? Not just them, but the English, they literally, land was the main reason that they came here. <laughs> like real estate was the primary reason. Um, our ancestors were enslaved because of real estate, right? Because they are buying these huge plantations. They don't want to work it. They really don't know how. Uh, they to, weren't to buying really, anything. They were given. Taking. They were taking mm -hmm. or given, depending on, well, really, because if they were given it from the government, that government took it. So you're right. right. But like, you're right about that too. But they're coming here for that purpose. Like, that is the main reason. So this, you cannot live in this country and and be outside of real estate. There's, it's impossible. In Texas, you know, each state has different laws but you know in texas as you know all land is supposed to be owned <laughs> so it's every i remember when i was in real estate school and they said everything is supposed to be owned like even if it's, if you see something that's not owned somebody got to own it like you got to find an owner when i heard that it blew my mind it really clicked to me it's like even if you decide you want to live on the street or you want to live in squat somewhere that's somebody's land so it's you have you cannot separate yourself from that you don't have to be you know intertwined with it to you know a large capacity but it is a part of everyday life and i remember i spoke with somebody else and she was talking about where you live determines what school you go to yes and what kind of education you get so and what kind of experiences you get as a child even you know are right. there parks are there playgrounds mm -hmm. you know what's the the the, the safety for a child walking to school in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it it's there's a lot attached to owning or even you know leasing real estate. Uh, one of the things that I thought was really unique when our country was started, and I only learned this from my living in the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, I had never heard of somebody building a house on someone else's land renting the land and paying for the house. I was like, mm. oh, you, I'd never heard of that. But the concept comes from Lord Baltimore, who was the first mm. governor of Maryland. And he, the concept, you know, that was back in the 1600s. Well, he's still, his family is still getting rental income from the properties that uh, the government gave him that he leased out to people he would he, he he had a wow a will or some type of legal document that said that they could never sell certain land they could lease it and they would have like 50 year mm -hmm. leases 100 year leases depending on the land and they wow. could build whatever they wanted on it but they but the baltimore family was going to get income from that and for now for 400 plus years my gosh, I've heard, I mean, obviously I've heard of that type of thing happening now, but not that in that capacity. <laughs> That's how you know? valuable land was. And especially wow. the land that they had on the East Coast where the most of the transportation and global commerce was shipping. So, right. yeah. Wow. Come on with this. That's why we love Miss Cynthia. Come on with the history and let the people know because <laughs> It is it's so so important. And so you we were talking about, you know, illustrations or examples of what racism looks like. And you have really broken down very well, um, like very well the systemic part, the fact that it's ingrained in our system. So what are some other examples of how a racism can play a role in uh can let me say it can be seen in real estate? Well, for one of the things, and, and I would suggest that many African-American uh, agents, real estate agents, face this probably more so than any other probably race of people or ethnicities. And that is the fact that we don't know what to expect. We're afraid to ask questions. And we're very materialistic and status starved. Mm -hmm. 
And that kind of mm. all runs together. When mm. you are poor, you have a sort of shame. Mm. And that shame is a thread that runs through a lot of your communications and learning experiences and, and transactions. If you don't know and you have this shame on you about asking people to explain why I have to do this, and is mm -hmm. there any other alternative? And and making sure that they're telling you the truth by doing your own research, maybe interviewing other agents. We go with the one that's the signs in front of the house, you know. Mm -hmm. But they don't know that that agent is representing the seller, not the buyer. Right. And sometimes it's they're never told that, so they go mm -hmm. in ignorant, looking mm -hmm. at only the house itself rather than the value and the appreciation of the neighborhood and 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 then expecting someone to represent their bent you know represent them and and they're not even being represented mm -hmm. they're just talking to an agent asking questions and you often spilling out their negotiating advantages to that other person's agent and that other person is bound to tell them the, you know, mm. the person they're representing. So we, we have a lot to learn about that. Mm. And then it's so important that we do because I a, a very good friend, he's a friend now, but he started off as a, a client. And this was, I was selling him his third or fourth house. I don't remember right now which one it was. And mm. he told me after I took him through the whole presentation, he said, Miss Cynthia, I had, this is my third or fourth house and you're the first person to ever explain anything to me. They just tell me to sign somewhere mm. and I just sign because I don't know, you know, and I'm trusting them. But if you're trusting the wrong person, if you're trusting the person that's representing the opposing party, mm -hmm. you know, you're not getting the benefit and don't tr even try to f sell it yourself, like for sale by owner. Because you don't have a clue unless you're a real estate agent or an investor that has been mm -hmm. investing a while and knows the market. You don't have a clue. Many of us look at um, Harris County Appraisal District. We look at those numbers for the value of our property. That's not mm -hmm. the value of your property. That's mm -hmm. the taxation valuation. And right. that's done on a general basis, not a specific. They go through your whole neighborhood and say, oh, most of the houses in here are three bedrooms, two baths built in 1965. And about this, you know, average size this. And that's where they get that value. Your house may have a whole lot more mm -hmm. or a whole lot less than other houses, but your taxes are going to be similar mm -hmm. because it's, an, it's a general appraisal rather than a specific one exactly Woo, you said a lot and i think um that part about as a, a client or a customer that becomes a client a lot of times um black people are not respected uh <laughs> who are in that position you know Meaning certain information is not given as you stated, but also it's it's assumed that we don't know things. Some of us and we, most of us don't. Right. And also being taken advantage of, you know, because mm -hmm. of that. So instead of you know, and, and, uh, and an agent or a broker has the responsibility to share information, but are they doing that at all, all times? Not if they know that some of them not if they know that they, they can get away with it, right? Because everybody oh. doesn't have integrity. Exactly. And even, even though it's an investor, I had, mm -hmm. um, I was working with a church not very long ago. In fact, you and I visited that church and shortly oh, after yeah, okay. we visited it, uh, he called me and said, someone is here offering me $30,000 for a lot that the church owns in the Northwest part of town, which this part of town is really booming, growing, building. And it's a a, a five thousand square foot lot, and they offered him thirty thousand. And so one of the members says, "I think you should call Miss Tibbs to see what is you know if that's the right price." 
And he called me while the guy was sitting there. And I said, well, I just sold the 6,000 one for about 90. So I don't think that 30 is good at all. And mm. we wound up selling it for about $80,000. So mm. you see, that's a $50,000 difference. Between, that's huge. That's huge. I had another uh, client um, wow. who inherited some property. And a lot of us inherit property, but we don't know what to do with it or aren't aren't able to do what we need to do with it, but right. we shouldn't let it go. We need to find right. out there's always a way to make money if you own real estate. So mm -hmm. um, this lady had been given an offer for her inherited house uh, from an aunt, nice size house, four bedrooms, three baths, you know, nice size, but old, needed updating and fixing up. Well, the man offered her $30,000 and she almost accepted that. For the house? But she had some title problems because she had not probated the will. And that's another thing we're ignorant about. If you are the heir of property and there's a will for the deceased person, within four years of their death, you must probate the will. Otherwise, the will becomes null and void. But there are ways around that, too, but it takes going through the courts. And so she right. had to go through the courts because she did not probate the will. And when I started doing my research, I was like, let me go see this house. Wait a minute. So I did. And I was like, oh, no, we're not telling him no. We're not selling this house for 30000 The title isn't clear. He can't make it clear without you. So, you know, we got out of that deal and sold the house for ninety thousand dollars, as is. So you see, that was that was a growth, growth loss in both of those cases. Had they accepted those, you know, but that happens so often, and it happens among the educated and the uneducated because now education is so specific. They don't. It's like if you go to college and you want to be a teacher, well, you need to know about houses too. I don't care what profession you're in. Everybody does. Everybody needs to know how that system works, where they live. And if mm -hmm. they don't, they're going to get taken advantage of if they don't use the right professions. And that's one of my big things, uh, land. Uh, I'm a Christian. And um, my reading of the Bible tells me that God thinks land is important because he made it, okay? And then he gave some to the, his people that he wanted them to have, and that made them a nation. So mm. when we mm. were first formed as uh, United States of America, if you didn't own land, you couldn't vote. Right. OK, mm -hmm. so and now that turned over where every citizen, whether they're landowners or not. But that was when the rich and the elite were making all the, the rules. They put in what they want. Half the people couldn't read anyway, so they didn't know what was being passed. There was no real public education system back then. And the one we have now is inadequate. But, uh, you know, hopefully it'll get better. But in the meantime, we have to look out for us. We do. Absolutely. And I think you're you're bringing up another good point. Um, first of all, I, I don't know how we missed that earlier, but I'm glad it came full circle with the fact that it is, <laughs> you know, it was so intertwined with political power. Um, and to a certain extent, it, it still can be, right? It but is. Also, right. <laughs> right. And then also, when you look at you know, the education system, I think you made a, an excellent point that we can't always rely on somebody else to teach us. And I um, was having this conversation, it had to be last week. Um, I don't remember what spike, uh, sparked the conversation, but it wasn't, you know, an interview or anything like that. But I was talking with somebody about um, like how in my mom's generation uh, that you know, she told me, you know, how certain things were taught at home mm -hmm. um, in the household, particularly black history. And it wasn't something that 
it was something that before integration happened, they were learning in school, right? But he said it wasn't something that the parents relied on the teachers to do. It was something that they already passed down. And that that is actually a part of our culture to pass down knowledge. Um, education starts at home. I know that sounds very cliche, but that's real. Like, Yes, it is. Our, that is that's a part of our socialization. That's a part of our development to be educated on various topics in the household. And when we don't teach those things, we are doing a major disservice. And we're actually setting up our communities to be taken advantage of. Because exactly. you know, people, people are going to try it. But now, you, know what? You, you have made a very valid point about home education. You know, we can't depend on the school system anymore to make our children aware of everything they need to know before they become adults. We have right. to expose them to things. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I, I mean, this is not just about African Americans. It's about poor people, indigenous mm -hmm. people, you know, That's uh, right. diaspora, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Because they, they, they're the ones that are being taken advantage of. Uh, poor people of color, they just, if they don't reach out to find it for themselves, they're not going to get it through the systems. Right. And there's so many, so many things to navigate. Um, and I, as I, as we begin to kind of uh, wrap up our discussion, I want to um, also touch on, you know, have, the, have you experienced as, not just as a somebody who's going into buy land or property or anything like that. But have you experienced racism on your end as a mm -hmm. broker? And what, give me an example of what happened and also how we can work on combating situations like that. Cause you know, there's so many rules, right? There's so many laws against it, but the law doesn't always dictate people's behaviors, right? There is no police for racism. Correct. That's There's no police for the real estate sales. There's no police unless you know enough to know that they did something wrong that you can report them to the Texas Real Estate Commission. There's nobody out here searching to make sure that it doesn't happen to you. So that's not going to be on you, whether you're buying a house or a car or anything other major type investment like that. It's when I joined this business, what, 40, almost 50 years ago, there was a caveat that says, let the buyer beware. But the the buyer didn't know why he needed to beware because real, real estate agents didn't tell him that. But back then, wow, the only person being represented by an agent in a real estate deal was the seller or the landlord. It was never the buyer or the tenant. All we did was take them and show them the properties, but we were actually working for the person who was going to pay our commission. Well, mm. that got out of hand. As, and as we developed this profession and wanted to become more acceptable uh, to uh, the public as professionals like attorneys, accountants, we wanted that same credential. So the National Association of Realtors, which had, uh, had been the original organization that started um, the, the ethics and the codes that we, we should be operating by, right. that their ethics and codes were adopted by each state and modified to agree with that state's laws in real, about real estate. So even though we've had some legal Realization, it's a it's a consumer based reporting system. It's not like you see that nobody's patrolling, nobody's doing audits unless somebody calls in and says you need to audit her or mm. audit him because I don't think I was. And even some of my students, when I've been teaching them, mm. and they bought houses, they go, "Well, nobody did that for us." <laughs> you know, mm. well, rules change over the years. How mm -hmm. long ago did you buy your house? And so, mm -hmm. well, some of them were uh, 
Asian immigrants, some of them were Hispanic immigrants, but I never, ever once that I can recall hear, 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 heard that complaint from uh, Caucasians. Mm. One of the other things that I want to stress with our, our people who have never purchased before mm -hmm. or who have never sold the property before, that you get a referred agent, someone that has worked with someone you trust and believe knows what they're doing. And they can better, if, if they purchased a house with an agent and everything went well, that's probably an agent you should interview. But I would suggest you interview at least three and make sure that they're giving you information that you can use and understand and explain to you, not just say sign here. <laughs> right. <laughs> because if they don't explain it to you, it's written in legal, legal language. We're right. trying as agents to understand what it means, but the public isn't. So you need to break it down to common language. So it's, it's, it's just a lot to it. Uh, another thing I want to stress is it's so important that we understand the value of land because, first of all, there's only a set amount of it on the earth, okay? Mm -hmm. Some of it is inhabitable because it's desert, okay? So if, if you unless you can figure out how to make that desert work for you, <laughs> you don't have to learn. Some people do, but, you know, I'm not Yeah, but that's usually that. a group thing rather than just an, a family here and a family there because it right. takes a whole <laughs> lot of people to settle a desert. But my point is, that's the, all the wars that we're hearing about now, what are they about? Real estate. Mm -hmm. Land. Wow. It's always been about land because that's mm -hmm. the finite resource that everybody has to have. Mm -hmm. Everybody. So it's going to always, any wars wow. we have are going to be about land. And mm -hmm. how we handle that war, I mean, Depends on your country, I guess. Mm, you made a really, really good point. Really, really good point. Because I think a lot of, there's other things, right? Like when people fight these wars, there's so many other things, but getting to the root. The root, wow. the root of it is land. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the root. The, uh, when, when the, uh, the other things are justification. That's justification. That's what they're doing. They're justifying what they're doing with all these political agendas. But it's really mm -hmm. about land. It's always right. been about land because land is necessary. You got to grow food. <laughs> You've got to have water. You've got mm -hmm. to have the minerals that come out of the land to operate all mm -hmm. this technology and all this industry we have. So it's mm -hmm. always about land. Um when I was growing up, a lot of manufacturing was done right here in the city of Houston. You don't find many manufacturers within the city uh, urban areas anymore. They are on the outskirts because that's where the less expensive land is. And they need right. a lot of it when they're manufacturing. So the bigger Houston gets population wise, the more we'll see those jobs going away because that land is so valuable. Now, mm -hmm. in Houston. if you own any land in Houston and you can keep it, keep it until you can't keep it anymore. You no know, more, it right? <laughs> yeah, leave it here for your heirs and teach them what to yes. do. With it. Because Say if you don't teach for the people them, in the back, oh yeah, if they don't, if if you don't teach them what to do with that land, it'll be gone. The tax man will get it. The investor who knows how to trick people out of their land will get it. And you'll just have worked all those years paying for it and they lose it right after you die. And that happens so much in our community. I have probably I've had more than 40 cases wow. dealing with heirs who don't understand that your grandmother, great grandmother, whoever it was, worked 30 years to pay for this house. Mm. And you're going to just let it go for taxes. And mm. out in some parts, like Acres Home, they pay, They had an acre of land with the house. Mm. You can put a whole lot of houses on that same acre of land these days right. in Acres Home. But 
people don't take the time. One, the late to the lady was so smart. She was a housekeeper. She had five kids, seven kids, and her husband died young. She raised those kids. She bought, paid, bought and paid for that acre and the house on it. Wow. And left a will to tell them how to distribute it. And nobody uh, probated wow. the will. So it's not it's a big family mess because it's three or four generations later. Her seven kids are great grandparents now. So now some of those wow. kids are deceased and their heirs have to be considered. So it just makes it one big mess to try to get 30 people to agree to do the same thing. So what do we wind up doing? We have to go to court mm -hmm. and let the judge decide how it's going to be done. And what usually happens, the judge will say, sell it, sell it within the next 30 days and get back to me. Now, wow. you don't want to get to that point where it's a forced sale. You want to cooperate. If you can't pay the taxes, mm -hmm. sell it to one of your cousins, sisters, brothers, or something who can pay. keep it in a yeah, keep it in the family. Keep it in the family. Or you at least keep it in the culture. In the community, right. Right. In the, and I don't mean the geographical community. I mean the cultural community. I know that, what you mean. <laughs> yeah. And and because People need to know that, well, we need to know, not people, because everybody else, I think, pretty much knows that. <laughs> Hispanic people come here, they're, they're doing, and, and the beauty of it is they're doing the same things, working hard in labor, sharing resources so that they can buy one house at a time. There's a, a, a group of Hispanics near me, and I live in Sunnyside, who have four big mansions. Mm -hmm. They didn't start out with four big mansions. They started out as immigrants, working hard, mm -hmm. saving their money, pooling their money, living together. In working places. together mm -hmm. with a strategy. Working, right. Putting it, now they, they bought this big, big property and divided it four ways. And wow. now, and there's three mansions on it and a little house for their parents. You know, so it's just we need to get into our mind that it you can't do these things alone. Right. You would have to be a multimillionaire or in and of yourself to achieve that. But if you work with a group of people that you trust and you're all on one accord and you get the right uh, people to represent you both legally and for real estate, you, you can do it. It's possible. Exactly. But it's hard to get past people's fears about being ripped off. But they're getting mm -hmm. ripped off anyway. Either way. <laughs> they really be, be, be strategic. Well, you have said, I'm over here like, like <laughs> you have said some amazing things. And I know we, we need to wrap up. So I want to ask you if you have any final words um, about the topic, about... Um, what the black community can do to continue to move forward, you know, amidst combating uh, real estate. Cause you've said a lot. So, you know, but I want, if there's anything else you want to add. This one point, and I hope I make it clear enough. Mm -hmm. We seem to chase money mm. as a group of people, because we think money is the cure all be all. Mm -hmm. But if you stop and think about it, the more money you make, the more money it takes to live like your parents did, okay? Because our economic system is fluctual. They fluctuated according to how much money is out there because they're trying to control the flow mm -hmm. of money. They're not trying, right. they are controlled. So mm -hmm. we go through pandemic, we get all these stimulus checks, and people go crazy. They don't invest in anything except maybe clothes and shoes and diamonds and cars. Car, if they could, which is not, yeah, and it's not really an investment. No, as soon as you drive off the lot in a brand new car, you've lost a, a thousands of dollars because yeah. it's not new anymore. 
but but to be honest with you, because of the chip situation in these uh, te new technical cars, actually, I bought a car last 2021. And the residual value this year was supposed to be like 21000 or next mm -hmm. year was supposed to be 21000 And the resale value on that car is almost as much as I paid for it because of the economy. We've wow. got to do our research. There's so much information out there. If you don't know, ask somebody. And don't ask somebody like your cousin who does not really know, just happened to go down and get a car but, he, you know, he may be paying twice as much as he should be paying for it. Do your homework. Save your money till you get exactly what you need to fit in your budget and to enjoy and meet your needs as a person or family. Because all that extraneous, I mean, that comes a time in your life when you get bonus money, you know, and you want to splurge a little. And that's OK, but you shouldn't be splurging like that every week. All the time. No, you can't. You got to be living above, above your means. Right. You've got to stay within that and you've got to work together as families. Um, I see it happening in every race, ethnicity in the United States on a major basis, but ours. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. Some pe I have a friend who has been involved in an investment group since ninth? well, his parents and his aunts and uncles started an investment group in 1956 that is still operating today. I've wow. never heard of that before in That's African phenomenal. American community. And they own lots of property, lots mm. that they bought from tax rolls, uh, foreclosure situations because mm. a group had come together and they had the resources to jump on top of those situations when they became available. But yeah, that can be done in our community. We just need to do it. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and don't just look at friends, even though you consider them, but consider people who are wise, who have already experienced that. If you need a, a partner in real estate, you know, ask somebody, you know, anybody who's willing to, you know, maybe buy this duplex with me. I'll, I'm going to live in one side and they can have the other side, you know, because that's the way right. to get things done. Uh, it's just not happening enough, though, because we're, we're too trendy mm -hmm. when it comes to using our money. We want to have a fine car. We want to show up with... The, $400 shoes and purse cost $2,500. <laughs> That's a car note. I mean, a car down payment and a little bit left over. You know, if you're paying $2,500 for a bag. I just can't even imagine. Never in my life. Well, they have them. That's a discounted one, too, by the way. Uh, Not I. I, I just think we need to be more thoughtful about how we spend our money, not just to make ourselves happy immediately, that immediate gratification thing. Long term. Long term investment. You're not gonna Longer die than, tomorrow. You're gonna need some money tomorrow and the next you're day. Thinking beyond your think beyond yourself. I think a exactly. lot of times we've you know, this society has conditioned us to think about our ourselves as individuals, but you know. We got to be thinking about generations that we can't even foresee. Well, think the, about the, what the, happens when you do that is you're preparing the next generation to take over what you already worked hard for. Right. And, and pay for and you want them to build on. But they need to learn exactly. how to build on. How that. to do it. Like mm -hmm. um, the family property I mentioned, that's been in our family since 1816. See there? See there? <laughs> 18 over 200 years there is um the black farmers association of america national black farmers of america have mm. won a lawsuit mm. of 2.2 i want to say billion dollars wow because so many black farmers have their land taken in the mm -hmm. south especially 
Right. Or they were swindled out of it or ran mm -hmm. from it because they were afraid of the KKK. Those kind of things have happened for, and, they, and when they were able to hang on to their lands, they weren't able to get the same kind of loans exactly. you know, to be successful in the farming business as our white counterparts. So as a result, and this has been going on, they lost not only the land, they lost the mineral rights, the air rights, you right. know, water rights, you know, everything. So now they're trying to do a semi-reparation. But I've got an attorney looking into it because I'm I'm like, okay, nobody really explained this to anybody. They just all of a sudden put it out there that there was mm -hmm. $2.2 billion, but what do I have to do to get it? You know, mm -hmm. so you need... Then they're going to want you to apply for a grant and, you know, for your own money. No, it's not even a grant. They give it to you, but you got to justify it somehow. Yeah, you got to give a you got to give a lot of information. Well, I want to I want to end on that note you made. I think you've um, given some invaluable information and I'm always appreciative of people like you who are willing to share this knowledge. Um, so I want to thank you again for being just the amazing person you are. And if you have any events or activities you like to share that are coming up, or um, a way that listeners can connect with you, please share. Well, if you have any question, and, and most of my clients will tell you that, I wouldn't care if I sold you nothing or, or sold something for you. I'm just trying to make sure that people don't get ripped off. Mm -hmm. And um, and it happens so much till it just bothers me. I, I recently mm -hmm. counseled on a case where property worth seven million only received two million because the people who wow. were selling it were inexperienced and they were dealing with very experienced legal people. Mm. And they signed paperwork without any advice. Wow. And this land had been in there in the family since right after Civil War. Wow. That's the kind of it makes me cry thinking mm -hmm. about because you know we have it so easy compared to what they had to go through to be able to acquire land, you right. know. And for someone a hundred and forty years later to come and say, Oh, let's just get rid of that, and don't even take the thought. To say, don't even well, understand how the much value. is it really worth? You know, mm -hmm. let me get a professional involved. That to me is mm -hmm. not good. Right. And it has nothing to do with education. It has to do with ignorance. Con yeah. You know, you, yeah. you think you know something that you really don't. And um, it hurts me. I did an article on that too in the African American News and, and Issues, but it it just bothers me that that happens so much. I do workshops for churches, mm -hmm. uh, for organizations to talk to them about these kind of things. I don't have one planned now because I'm really a home health care person for <laughs> right now for my husband. But I would do that again if and and I have some uh, attorneys that I work with also mm -hmm. that I can bring in. It's a social justice type of ministry. So that's awesome. And how can people um, keep up with you? Um, oh, my number, my text me. I prefer you text me. If you need to email me, that's okay. But text me that you emailed me. <laughs> can can they uh, contact you via HAR? No, because, um, well, the heart would give them my information, of course. Right, that's what I'm saying. So you can, yeah, you can look up, you can look up Miss Tibbs um, at har dot com. I want to thank you, or Trek, mm -hmm. and I want to thank you so much again um, for those who are listening, also um, and, and tuning in, and be sure to connect with Decolonizing Real Estate Podcast. Um, you can find us at gumballthepodcast dot com. Our Instagram is also gumballthepodcast. And also on my realtor page, Realtor Lynn. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and thank you so much for listening.